Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's session with Gabriella Carifa Johnson. My name is Anya Kaplan, and I'm head of operations and events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. Throughout today's session, we encourage you to engage in conversation and to keep your camera on. And now I'll turn it over to our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thanks, Anya. It's so good to see you guys um, again. Yes, those do seem interesting. I'm in Oops. I don't know who that was, but um, <laughs> this, guys, we, two weeks ago, I think we uh, had the first of our summer mentoring sessions with Aaron Preston. This is the second one. We're really scheduling them for every couple of weeks throughout the summer and in the fall. And it's really meant to continue what we started last year with Virgil, where he spoke to you and sometimes spoke with a partner of his or a friend from the industry. And, and so I'm, especially excited today that we have Gabriella Kareefa Johnson, who was a friend and colleague of Virgil's, and she's joining us today to kind of carry this tradition of mentoring virtually and talking to you a little bit through answering my questions and then really opening it up and making it conversational the way we did it two weeks ago with Heron and the way Virgil did it and really encouraging you guys after Gabriella and I talk a little bit to just start raising your hand and ask asking questions of her. Um, I'm going to jump right in, Gabriella, just with a quick introduction of you so everybody appreciates who you are. Um, Gabriella began her editorial career at Vogue, where she's currently an editor at large. She then worked at the fashion department at Garage Magazine, rising to the position of fashion director. She styled some of the most iconic magazine covers, including the garage cover of Mary J. Blige, Lakeith Stanfield for her interview, Billie Eilish for Vanity Fair, and in and last January, uh, with the styling of model Paloma El Cesar, Gabriella became the first Black woman to style a Vogue cover. Uh, congrats and thanks, Gabriella, for that. Um, and also, and, and maybe not quite as, as remarkable, but certainly important to me and, and the team is that Gabriella in 2012 was an FSF scholar, so. Sure was. <laughs> I just sort of love the circle, Gabriella, and here you are. So uh, ready to jump in if you are, and really just start at the beginning when you were an undergrad at Barnard, graduated with uh, cum laude with a degree in art history. Maybe art history not being the obvious major one chooses if one wants to get into the industry. And just wondering why, um, what led you to that major and kind of what that then meant for you in terms of what you took from Barnard and art history to move into the industry. Absolutely. Well, first of all, hi everyone. It's so good to see you. And I'm like very impressed that everyone showed up and is willing to participate in this conversation because it's something that I would have loved when I was an undergrad, undergrad at Barnard. As Peter said, I studied art history. And I think because of the fact that similar to Virgil, I came from a pretty traditional background. My mother, you know, is West African and American, and she was a doctor. And I kind of come from a family of like lawyers and doctors and academics. And I really struggled with the idea that fashion felt like a frivolous industry or not a worthwhile pursuit. And I applied to Parsons. I, you know, I was so obsessed with fashion that I would make these dream resumes that were dated for like 2025 and I would send them out to companies and be like, well, I don't, haven't done anything in fashion, but I hope by 2025 I've done this. And I was really, really excited about being a part of the industry. So I applied to Parsons and I applied to RISD. And in the end, I think I kind of fell prey to a little bit of um, family pressure to get a liberal arts degree which I absolutely do not regret. Um, while I think that maybe doing more traditional education in the fashion industry might have given me a leg up initially, really what sang in all of this interview process was that I had a really well-rounded and holistic education that could inform my stylistic interests and what I wanted to do in fashion. So studying art history was, I think the closest that I could get to a really specifically aesthetic discipline within the context of a liberal arts university. And I had no idea how much the world of fashion is in partnership with the world of art and design. And I studied American contemporary art. And as soon as I started interning and working in positions in which I was supporting fashion editors, I really found that research was a huge element of my job. There is 
of course, the editor who goes into the world after seeing the collections and digests all of the information they saw on the runway and um, kind of tries to metabolize that information and then communicate that in a digestible way to our audiences. That's what an editor does. I often use the analogy of like, we're like these space voyagers and we go and see these different planets and these incredible minds of these alien designers. And then we come back to our home planet and we explain what we saw in ways that they can understand. Um, and I, I found out almost immediately when I started doing that as an editor myself, that there is a vast universe of references from culture to fine art, to street art, to day-to-day -day life that informs the design process and ultimately the clothes that we see on this runway. And it was so gratifying to be able to walk into a show without picking up the show notes, which are typically kind of like on your seat when you go to a show that explains the ethos and the thesis of the collection and be able to look at these looks, walk down the runway and say, oh, this is, this is a little Bauhausian. Like maybe they were looking at Berlin Dadaism, maybe, you know, Picasso's staircase and um, mobility movement was a source of inspiration here. And it, and the, the foundation that I had of an art history degree really helped me build the narratives in my fashion stories. I think a lot of stylists operate um, specifically on trend. And so you go to a show and you are all of the shows. It's a, it's a month long, gosh, you guys, it is a, <laughs> it is a process to go to the collections, but it, that I'm very grateful to be able to do, but you go through. And then at the end of that month, you're like, okay, well, there were coats, there were stripes and, you know, there were wide leg pants. And I found it so easy to kind of get trapped into the idea of being like, okay, well, I'm going to do my coat story. And the entire crux of this story is about the clothes. When in actuality, we spend our lives in fashion. We, we dream in fashion. We watch movies in fashion. And the idea of being able to have a story that's outside of the context of the actual physical clothing that you are seeing on the runway is what I think is the backbone of fashion editorial um, practice. Um, I always want to tell a story. So understanding the history and the layers of these visual languages going into being a fashion editor was super, super helpful in refining what my personal aesthetic is, but also how to um, engage with aesthetic and artistic movements that predate me. I now appreciate why one studies art history and could then go <laughs> into the industry. I love you sharing that, Gabrielle. Thanks. Um, shifting a little bit um, to the digital space, and I know you know it's it's a space in which you now work um, for all good reason, creatively and, and technically. Has mm -hmm. it changed the way you approach styling and and the editorial projects you work uh, on? And maybe just talk a little bit about social media and how that um, engages you and, and your audience. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that social media has opened up the landscape like enormously for editorial possibilities. On one hand, there was like a real resistance, I think, in the magazine world specifically, which is really tied to this traditional idea of like a print magazine that you open. You can only really get the full feeling of the story if you have it in your hands and you're flipping the pages. There was some resistance to the idea of like, how do we integrate this vast new internet world and landscape, especially social media into that. And then when we all started realizing me specifically that it's just a way of opening the work that we do to a much larger audience and also a way of finding more references, more ideas, new talent, you know, new concepts. Um, it became like a real research tool for me. I think out of the probably five new photographers I've worked with since last season, four of them I first became acquainted with on Instagram. And it made me really appreciate the fact that there is a group of young people such as yourselves who are out there curating the cultural landscape for kind of old farts like me and really leading me to places of in sources of inspiration that I, I wasn't aware of until I was on Instagram in the way that I am now. I think personally, fashion editorship has always carried this like cult of personality around it. You know, I'm in, by the way, this is not my house. I'm at Vogue magazine right now where I work. And I grew up with like the devil wears Prada and like Anna Wintour and this like, like scary person. And 
I think on social media, we are able to open up our lives, our inspiration, our stories in ways that like, this sounds crazy because we're not robots, but like humanizes us. And if I had somebody to look at that looked like me, who came from my background, that um, shared funny stories on Instagram, and I didn't only know them through their work and through their their image that you see in like, you know, unprinted magazines, I think I would feel much more comfortable. I would have felt much more comfortable entering the fashion space. Um, and so I find that social media for me personally, I like to use it as a tool to connect with my audience and let them know who I am. And also say, like, if I'm here, you definitely can be here <laughs> because in a lot of ways, I'm like a bit of a shall we say problem child within, within the walls of Vogue magazine. I'm a little bit of like a fire starter. But at the end of the day, I think that the people who are looking at Vogue who aren't long, long time readers or kind of like millennial and boomer and Gen X readers are engaging with the work that I put out there, probably because they know who I am and they can relate to who I am and they can understand my work because it's a, in a sense a reflection of who they are. Um, so social media has been like such an eye opening tool for me. And I think in a lot of ways, the fashion industry is still figuring out how to use it practically. I think a lot of huge brands are kind of like synthesizing these like short, like keynotes of how to you kind of like blurbs of how to use social media, like the influencer and like the logo mania, and it has to have a song under it and we need to make a TikTok. And that is actually, I think the least the less successful way that fashion is engaging with social media. I think the biggest asset that it has for us is being able to open up authentically our world and show our audiences what the nitty gritty and intimate details of this like very challenging, frankly, and very polarizing and difficult industry is. It also is like an amazing tool when you're going into like a board meeting with like 60 year old white women and you're like okay cool you don't get this idea but look at there's 15 million likes here so there has to be something like you can really use it as a bargaining chip to push through concepts that otherwise would seem um maybe less than you know less than at the level of what high fashion should be i love that I don't know that I'd characterize you as a problem child, but I think <laughs> <laughs> I just need to start a few fires. But we got <laughs> okay. Fire fun. starter sounds good. <laughs> At the end of the day, I think what is so exciting about your entire generation, and I think I am also part of it, maybe on the later end of it, is it's like the there are gatekeepers in this industry who are like actually begging to be told what to do, and now we're finally in a position in which we can say like, we don't really want a seat at your table. Like your old table is crusty. Like we want a new table and we're going to build it from scratch. Nice. Um, Gabriela, I know you work with Off-White, you worked with Virgil. Um, any particular memories of, of those connections and learnings that may have stayed with you from that association? Absolutely. I mean, Virgil and I became friends through um, mutual friends. I think I, I kind of grew up with, but like not really with Gigi and Bella who have been with the off-white brand for since the beginning. And Virgil always told me like, this is, this brand is design. Like it's true and pure design and it is real fashion, but it's also community. And, it, and the models made so much of this brand, you know, having these kinds of, um, personalities co-sign his vision before the, you know, larger fashion community had was really an asset. And so I came into it knowing that I was meeting and working with a genius because that's what these models were telling me. And I met him and he like blew me away with like the depth and breadth of his like intellect experience, the way in which he wanted to like completely change this industry. And it, it, it kind of manifested professionally for us on one project really crystal clear in my mind. So I think I'll use that as an example, but we were in the middle of a pandemic, of a pandemic, the pandemic that we're currently living in. Um, and uh, this is actually kind of like a personal story too. Um, our editor in chief had left Garage Magazine and I was the fashion director at the time, but I was kind of working as an interim editor in chief because I was the most senior person there, if you can believe it, at 28. That's why it was such an amazing magazine. Um, and 
I didn't, we didn't have the support of our publisher the way that our preceding editor in chief did, who was, you know, admittedly like a very well connected white man. And he demanded the respect that I think it was hard for us to get from our bosses at the time. And I begged and begged and begged them to let me edit our last and final issue before they shut us down in COVID. And it was kind of right around the time in 2020 when like the world was reconciling with the fact that white supremacy exists and everyone was kind of doing like their black issue. And we were like, okay, this is not really like a commodifying moment. Like Black Lives Matter remains to be about living with dignity and equity in a space that like in a world that doesn't actually um, allow that or support that. And so rather than doing our issue that was branded as like our all black collaborators issue, we were like, we're gonna do an issue that is organic to who we are. And we just happen to be a staff that is all people of color. And without even thinking that that was like our mandate, we ended up collating a bunch of ideas that all revolved around like these brilliant thought leaders. And those organically sourced thought leaders all were people of color. And it was just like such a proof of concept of like, this is where creative genius exists right now. And there's no reason why platforms shouldn't be employing these voices all the time. So at that point, I'd happened to be friends with Virgil. He was, as I think you guys know, he was someone to everyone. And, you know, he was a friend to the person, you know, sweeping the floor up to the CEO of Mercedes Benz. So I felt really comfortable reaching out to him and saying, we have this project. We want to work with you. Um, you know, everybody was kind of talking about the resurgence of like all of the historical ideas about uh, Black Wall Street and the Tulsa massacre. It was like the first time that a lot of us were learning about that. And we figured because we were a fashion and design magazine that rather than going tr the traditional route and working with Virgil in a fashion capacity, we wanted to work with him in an architecture capacity. And so, you know, I just got on the Zoom with him and I hopped on and I was like, so if Black Wall Street wasn't ever burned down, like, what do you think he would look, it would look like? And literally from the second that he like clasped onto the, the concept, he was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to get my network. This Aurora is going to send us these pictures. Khalil is going to send us this artwork. We're going to create a map of what Tulsa would look like um, topographically with all of the food deserts and like his I didn't realize until that point, professionally speaking, I'd realized this personally, but he was such, he was a planet. Like he was a planet and then he had this gravity that like sucked in all of these universes that rotated around him and like he was the nexus of it. And so, and I just remember him saying, look, this is like a huge big idea, but don't think about it as a big idea. Like this is a sprint. This isn't a marathon. We're not sending this out and refining and refining. Like there are brilliant minds that we all know. We're going to po pose this exact same question to them and we're going to collate it into a feature. And you have to trust me. You have to take your like features editors out of it. You have to take your art directors out of it. The product that we will come up with will be, it will say everything that needs to be said. And within a week, he had come back with like this manifesto, visually stunning, um, incredibly uh, acute in its focus, but could have been the entire issue. And so what I, I think what I'm trying to communicate with that is regardless of how vast, how vast his world was, at the center of it was community. And I think that's something that I took away from my working relationship with Virgil is that at the end of the day, community is what's going to be, is what's going to hold us down. And that's what's going to codify all of our ideas. And that's what's going to be the architecture underneath um, this editorial world, this new editorial world. Love it. That, I, thank you so much for sharing that, Gabrielle. Love it. Um, shifting a little to a more practical question, perhaps. You had some great internship experiences yourself. Mm -hmm. A lot of our scholars are just started theirs. Um, I think you, Teen Vogue, L, Women's Wear, Lure, Moda. How how did you get them? Can you let us know how that how you made that yeah. work? And also, kind of once you got there, how you made it work and and turned it into a successful experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as I said, I really wanted to work in fashion. So even though I needed to go, you know, I felt the pressure to go to a liberal arts 
university and get a traditional education, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to New York and I'm, you better believe I'm going to be working and I'm going to make my way into those magazines. And so this is like very lo-fi and I'm sure there are like way more elegant ways of doing this now, but I would read the mastheads of magazines and then I would try every single formula for an email, like first name, underscore, last name at allure.com, whatever. And I would cold email like hundreds of people. And I did this the summer before my freshman year and all of them bounced back except for like five, two of them were like, well, you have no experience. So we're not going to hire you. And I, and in my mind, I was like, well, how do you get experience? If like, you don't get hired to learn it. Um, and one came back and that was in the fashion closet of Allure magazine. And I went into my interview and I was blown away at how everyone, it seemed like everyone was in like designer clothing and like knew each other and were really connected. And I felt like such an odd man out. And it was a group interview and they kind of went around the circle and asked people questions. And they would say like, who's your favorite fashion editor? And like a kind of, a few people like stumbled, a few people had ideas. And then it like came to me and I was like, Grace Coddington. And it was, and they were like so shocked that I knew who Grace Coddington was because obviously they had their own preconceived notions of who I was because I wasn't, you know, in head to toe Celine and all that stuff. Um, and then they kind of asked me some follow up questions, and I ended up nailing the interview and getting the job. And I worked so hard. I would be the first one there. I would like beg to take the coffee orders so that I could have some face time with the editors. I would, you know, go out and do all of our runs. This was before there were like labor laws. So, so we would just like work for free for like many, many hours. Um, and I would, you know, hauling garment bags through the subway. And it was a very physical job at the time. And I think I did really well. And they kind of knew that I would, I would do more than is like necessary. And so I just kept kind of getting recommended. And I started at Allure and going up to the, 20, uh, the I guess it was the 20th floor at the time. We were at Four Times Square. That was like a big deal. Cause like you might see Anna or you might see Grace or like Tawny Goodman might be walking down the hall. And I got sent up to like, I think they, we had a look that they wanted. So I like came to transfer the look and I very sneakily snuck over to the fashion assistant at the time. And I was like, are you guys looking for interns? Because mine is almost up at Allure. You know, you really have to have gumption in those days. Like you had to do the, you had to kind of do the maneuvering and they were like, not right now, but we'll hit you up in the summer. They ended up hitting me up and I just, I mean, I just never stopped. Like it kept rolling over and I ended up going to many, many magazines. At one point, I just felt so, I felt, I felt that I was never going to be a fashion girl. Like I was always going to be thought of as like an intern and like the, the hard worker, like the work mule, like I could get it done and work the long hours. I could pick up the heavy trunks, but I wasn't going to be sent on set for these like extraordinary opportunities with like amazing stylists and editors and I kind of thought, okay, you know what? Maybe this isn't for me. It seems like it's really gatekept. It's like very, um, it's like a, it's a world in which connections really matter. I'm going to go to the feature side because I have this liberal arts education and I love the analytical part of fashion. And I kind of, for a moment thought I was going to be a fashion writer. Like I thought I was going to be a journalist. So I switched over to features. My first job after a million internships, my first job in at Vogue was with Hamish Bowles and I was kind of like a research assistant. I did like a lot of um, copywriting and, you know, headline writing and head index, which we call display in the magazine industry. And I just felt like I, it made more sense for me because I wasn't that fashion girl. But when an opportunity to work for Tawny Goodman, who was a fashion director at the time, came up, I was really hesitant. I was like, you know, I just don't want to get rejected. And, you know, she always has like the fabulous rich girls do this. And it's just not who I am. And I ended up having an interview and we really connected and we talked about art, which is another reason why I feel that my education um, really helped me. And we ended up becoming this like crazy odd couple, like this like Upper East Side, like blonde white lady and like me, like literally living in Crown Heights, like wearing like my Converse to set. And it was the beginning of, you know, a new relationship for me in terms of like who I could be and what room, which rooms I could be in. I wish I had the confidence at the time to know that I could have always been there, but it felt really rarefied. And through that experience as an assistant, I was like, you know what, I can do this. And when it became time for me to leave that role, because, you know, at, at Vogue and in magazines in general, there's a, there's not a lot of vertical, um, 
opportunity. Like it's kind of like you, you're an assistant and then like maybe you become an assistant editor and then you have to kind of leave and go to another magazine at like a higher title and then come back. So that's exactly what I did. I think I got off topic there. <laughs> I don't really know what we were talking about, but internship, sorry, practical internship. Do as much as you can. And I think experience as much of the, the world that you can. And like, if you want to work in fashion, like do some design, do maybe um, features, like maybe try and get a feel for PR. Because as I said, I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be in fashion, but I just never saw myself as a, as a fashion girl, so to speak. And so features seemed like the best fit for me, but until I had the opportunity to try and be in those spaces, I wouldn't have known. Thanks, Gabriel. So um, Virgil has often talked about mentoring, and this is a form of mentoring right now. He's had some mentors that he really valued, you know, along his journey and talk about how transformative that experience was for him. Mm -hmm. What about you? You mentioned Tani Goodman. Yeah. Were there Have there been mentors for you? Um, and, and, and these students that are on the screen, they've all been assigned mentors. So how do you work that relationship and how do you get the most out of it? Um, as a mentee? Yeah, um, well, Tani is definitely, I would say that she is my, has been my biggest mentor and my longest running mentor. She still is. We see each other for dinner at least once a month. We try and make it two times a month. Um, and the way that I kind of nurture that relationship is that I'm, I'm, I'm never afraid to ask questions, even to this date where I've done so much on my own. It's like, there's still so much wisdom that she can give me that I really rely on because this is a woman who, yes, it's very, very different from me aesthetically. I often say like the reason why my styling looks the way it does is because I learned how to do Tawny styling. And then I learned how to like completely undo it. Like, I think that in a lot of ways, like I'm the reverse side of her classic, simple, modern Americana. I'm like the messy, eclectic, like kind of chaotic side of Americana. And I, I, I found very early on that what was interesting to me was like dissecting these, this traditionalism and creating what is more like a, a surreality of what the traditional and the American and the modern means. Um, so in a lot of ways, I still study her work. I, I go to her um, as soon as I have an idea, I'll kind of run it past her. And usually like, if she doesn't like it, I know it's amazing. <laughs> and I just, I, I make sure to speak with her during the collections. Like that's something that I do all the time so that we can kind of like have, be a soundboard for one another with what we're seeing, because you know, two, two people can be sitting next to each other at a fashion show and one can see Mars and the other one can see Venus. And like, you have no idea what the other perspective is until you really engage with it. And then I think, I think also like really having formal structures to the way in which you communicate with your mentor. Like I, I make sure that we have a schedule on when we're going to check in. I email her a lot. We, we have honest and authentic conversations about work, but I also talk to her a lot about my personal life. I think like having a personal relationship with your mentor is almost as important, if not more important than having the professional kind of technical relationship. And I also think collect them, like collect as many as you can. Like, even if you're, even if you're in an internship for six weeks, stay in touch with that person, stay in contact with them. You never know the ways in which their expertise and their knowledge will inform what you are planning on doing. And also don't be afraid to be um, explicit and intentional in, in sharing information with people. Like, I really think I wish that there were people that were like, you know what, I would love to get your number. Or like, do you want to take my number? Like I was never the person who had business cards, but we are, this is an industry of networking. As I said, Virgil was such a clear vision of that, but like community is really at the core of this. And the wider you can build of a network and especially of a network of people who know more, have seen more, have done more, it will really serve you. I think ultimately people in fashion want to nourish, you know, the next generation. It's just there's like a little bit of toxicity about like competition that sometimes muffles that, but you can break through it. It's really, really easy <laughs> to do that. That's really helpful. And I, you know, as, as the administrators of our mentorship program, absolutely like be really pointed, really ask for more, be specific. Um, you know, it, it, it really does then lead to something that can be really rewarding. So um, shifting a little, Gabriela, we talked about some of your iconic covers, talked about the Paloma cover. 
we're at a place where the industry is talking a lot about doing more to make sure that it's equitable and diverse and inclusive. Like, what do you think about that in terms of how much, how soon, how effective, what needs to be done? What's your, your take on where we are and where we need to go and, and who's doing what? I think that we are doing a lot of patting ourselves on the back in fashion and it's not necessarily justified. <laughs> I think it's like, look at us. We had a curved girl on a cover, like box checked, we're done. And it, and in reality, diversifying this world has nothing to do with forcing the issue. It just has to do with opening our eyes to what has always been here, what has always informed the fashion industry, who has always purchased clothing, who has always um, driven style. And I think that um, there are magazines that are, you know, doing a great job at expanding what their viewpoint at Vogue. We say like, this is a Vogue girl, which is like a very, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty problematic idea, except for when we started think, you know, expanding what that Vogue girl was. And it became more about values and ideas and um, style than like what they looked like on the outside. I think that um, in general, the editorial landscape is like much easier to be inclusive because there are so many stories that haven't been told for hundreds of years since the beginning of fashion magazines. And so there's so much opportunity to do that. And I think rather than it becoming, you know, this, this thing that we have to do in order to be competitive in this marketplace and to be accepted as a progressive title, it should be something that we do by virtue of the fact that like, there are women that are dope that are not a size two, or like there are black designers who like might not have the platform or the resources to be showing at Paris Fashion Week, but throw an amazing party with all of these girls and fabulous looks in Bushwick. And so I think that the, the more structured traditional fashion industry is embracing more of those ways of expressing diversity. Um, but I think we have a really long way to go, especially I'll speak specifically to, to body diversity, because that's something that is passionate to me. I'm somebody who cannot walk into Prada and buy clothes. And that is a huge problem to me. Um, I think there's so much to be said for the performance of doing it and having a plus size girl on the runway. But what we might not know as people who are shoppers or an audience that isn't intimately acquainted with the process of developing collections that size 16 dress on the runway was a custom dress that was made for that model that then becomes one sample that needs to be shared with every market in the world. Um, and then ultimately doesn't get produced into a commercially viable size 16. So I think we have a lot of work to do in, 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 in walking the walk. And I think we're, we're kind of like, we, we've, we've made it in talking the talk, but now we really need to walk the walk. So I would like to see that one sample becoming an entire sample set. I would love like that sample set to be available in both the European and domestic regions. I would love for that ultimately, ultimately to become looks that you can purchase in store. And I think we're working towards that. And there's a, there are a lot of people like me who are putting pressure on that system, but we do have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding heads. So um, I think we all agree. But what I'd like to do, because I know, Gabby, you've got a hard stop. So um, guys, why don't we open it up now to, to ask some questions and just start raising hands and I'll call or Gabriella can call on you. So Oh, I just saw that Marie is on this call yeah. and Marie was who I was emailing with when I was an FSF scholar. Just saying, hey, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So questions, guys, for Gabriella. I'm also very happy to keep ranting, but I want to hear from you guys. <laughs> is there anyone who on this call who is interested in being a stylist specifically? Oh, hey, Tiana. Do you oh, want to? Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I know I joined the call late. I was on a different call for an internship. So I'm no worries. I missed the whole spiel and everything. It's okay. I hope you got the internship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes, oh, really? actually, um, with the yeah. makeup. Thank you. Oh, wow. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so you're the, you're a senior? Are you a senior? Or you're no, a senior? I just recently graduated last month mm -hmm, okay, from cool. Thomas Jefferson University. So it will be your first internship in the styling world. 
well, not really styling because it's under makeup. So my personal passion is to be a fashion stylist. So that's why I appreciate this call. So kind of just getting like that experience and kind of just hearing how your process was. And did you always know that you wanted to be a stylist? Because I know for me, when I attended Jefferson, I was fashion design and then I made the switch to fashion merchandising and management. Yeah. So I just wanted to like kind of hear your feedback along that process of your story since I kind of yeah. missed it. Um, no, 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 no worries. I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't know that styling was a job when I was <laughs> kind of like figuring out what I wanted to do in the fashion industry. And I kind of ping pong back and forth between like features and which I thought was really analytical and academically interesting and styling, which I realized could also be analytical and academically stimulating. Um, but I think, you know, I, I got so much experience in, in my internships. I did like a bajillion of them. And I found that the tactility of styling and like really getting your hands on the clothes was this like gratifying feeling that you actually can't get in any other realm in fashion. It's like, I also wanted to be a fashion designer at one point, which I don't think I told the class yet, but I wanted to be a fashion designer. And then I found out that I just like was not talented at fashion design. <laughs> and so I found another inroad and I feel like styling is like as close as you can get to being a fashion designer without doing that as, as a stylist, if you end up engaging with or working with a fashion designer on their runway shows, like the people who style the shows, you're actually really intimately involved in the process of creating the collection. There's, there's usually, you know, a second bit of your job as a stylist for a brand that is consulting. And so you'll see the fashion fabric swatches, you'll see the sketches, you'll see the mood board and you'll build the character together in the same way that you kind of build a fashion story, a, fa a narrative fashion story to tell through the pages of the magazines, you tell them in the looks on a runway. So I don't think you should discount the idea of the fashion design world. You'll definitely as a stylist brush up against it and you'll um, be able to learn that way. But makeup is a very cool industry to get into and it is actually the hardest campaigns to style because they're like this big you can they really want to focus on the face so you have six inches to communicate a fashion story like you have from the chest to the shoulder and it can't be too distracting or competing with the makeup but it also has to have an identity so it those are always my hardest jobs yeah I totally agree especially because makeup and fashion go so hand in hand like how you said like for runway shows like they're basically like a partnership they're almost like best friends is kind of how yeah. I see it so you can also express yourself like through the clothes and as well through the makeup that still also tells the story and it's still like a healthy balance of the two so yeah. I definitely agree with what you said yeah totally yeah totally and glam plays like a huge like a huge part in my process too like I often start with pulling a mood board of the hair and the makeup before I even identify the clothing. Cause I just think, especially in today's day and age and you guys' generation, Generation Z engages with makeup so like professionally, <laughs> like it's like a really serious enterprise in a way that like we kind of missed in the 2000s, except for like really disgusting tiny eyebrows, which we all did, unfortunately. Um, but you guys are like Pat McGrath, like level makeup artists now. And it is wild to me. So I'm like, still learning and incorporating that in my process, but it, it's sometimes it's like the beginning of the inspiration. <laughs> okay, Ifioma, I hear you. I am also kind of a millennial, so I need to, we need to, I need to leave y'all alone. That's true, that's true. But you really do be beating the face, okay? <laughs> Ify. <laughs> <laughs> you're so funny. Um, is there anyone else who is like interested in magazines? Or, or even if you're not, like I'm very happy to answer any questions that I can answer not like yes yeah. what's up amira <laughs> hey so i'm from kansas and i know you talked about how you kind of just broke into new york by doing a lot of cold emails and cold calls and when i went to new york for the fsf gala i fell in love with the city and got so inspired with it so do you have any more tips for just kind of navigating that or just making it to new york in the yeah. industry Definitely. So I have the um, great fortune of being able to come here as a student. So like, you know, housing is super expensive here, like transportation is expensive. So a lot of those things were like taken off my plate. It is like a difficult space to navigate in that way. But one thing that I would say is, first of all, now you have me. So you have somebody that you know that you can email and we already have a new connection and I live here. So definitely do that. But the other thing that I would say is one way to kind of, if you're interested in like, I don't know what you want to do specifically, actually, will you tell me? 
I like more like the business side of fashion. So right now I'm doing a digital marketing internship as well as a website merchandising. So okay. more analytical businessy side. Okay, well, that's amazing. Well, I would say like one of the things that you can do to like get yourself here is especially now after, you know, the pandemic, there's like so much um, remote work that can be done in ways that you can like really flex your analytical brain. Like Mm -hmm. for me specifically thinking, I'm like, okay, so you're probably interested and good at numbers, project management, and are somebody who could be like a huge valuable asset in like a production capacity. So it's like, at least from my perspective, we work on like huge multi- you know, hundreds of thousand dollar budget, but we have like an incredible production team who like keeps us on track, who's like actually creatively involved in the process. And even though that's outside of like maybe buying or traditional merchandising or marketing, I know that those agencies often have a lot of remote work. And so that can be, that could maybe be an inroad in, or like, I don't, I'm very much like, as I said, I was like an intern who worked my way up to editor at large, but I think that that's actually like, almost a bygone concept. Like you guys should definitely intern and experience, but this like linear trajectory is way more flexible now. So I would say, you know, even if you you maybe can't come here and immediately be working as, you know, a buyer or a merchandiser for your favorite brand, like go work in the store. Do you know what I mean? And like, learn, and like learn like the backend system and learn about like, you know, inventory and that kind of thing that would actually pay your bills at the same time as hopefully you can be doing an internship which is like probably not going to like cover living in New York but will actually give you the you know experience of being in the field that you think that you want to be in but yeah as I said like if you want to come here you need a place to crash I have a spare bedroom you know you guys all know me now so (laughs) dm me or whatever thank you yeah Thank you. But it's hard. It's really hard to navigate. I think somebody in the chat just said the same thing. It's like, it's really like a hard and expensive city. And I have to say, like, just to be like very crass and like talk about all of this, literally my first internship, I think I made $10 an hour and it was only part-time and I lived with five roommates. I really lived in a basement and it actually had rats in the walls, but I lived in a basement and I paid like $400 a month on rent and I could afford it. But like, I worked really hard and worked my way up. And I really think that there's opportunity and space to do that. But I think connections and like creating this network. And it's so amazing that you guys have FSF because that's already an enormous network. And then, and then Virgil, I mean, you guys are a really prestigious scholarship group. So I think, okay, we have hands raised. Sorry, Tiana and Nasha. maybe I don't know who went, who was first. I used to was first, so she can go. Okay. Uncle. So. Hey. I heard that you're a fire starter. Yes. I am also a fire starter. However, <laughs> I find it, it's hard, I find it hard to navigate starting a fire respectfully. Yeah. Um, trying to be professional. I've voiced my opinions before. Um, at one internship and I got labeled the opinionated one mm-hmm. um, and for the next three weeks my life was very uncomfortable and so I had to kind of prove that my opinion was valid mm-hmm. um, so how do you do that I think um, for me I I try and have it mapped out in my head. Like if I know something and I'm have an opinion that I want to communicate, I make sure that I have the point, the counterpoint, the rebuttal, the, you know, the, the research to back it up. And in a lot of ways, like the reality is you guys, cause I'm seeing like a lot of women of color here, also women in general, also, you know, men of color, you know, marginalized groups in general, especially in corporate settings, which by the way, like so much of fashion is corporate. Like we want it to be like beautiful and creative and like all of that, but like so much of it is corporate. It's difficult to hold your ground and communicate your ideas if they're in opposition to, you know, the gatekeepers and majority stakeholders. It's difficult to do that without being labeled a problem child, which is why I use that and fire starter. But at the end of the day, you're there because your point of view is valued. Even if it's, you know, negated from time to time, like you our ideas are our currency in this industry like that's what we trade on that's what gets us hired like 
our mind trust is what these companies want to activate. So if you have an idea and you think that you're getting resistance to it, probably that means that it's a really good idea, but also being open to hearing feedback and criticism and like reevaluating your own ideas because sometimes we're wrong and don't want to be is also, you know, it's something that I'm still learning too. But I think just being super informed and super deliberate and communicating as effectively and efficiently as possible really helps. But yeah, like you're probably going to be labeled as defensive because like, hello, black women, like, sorry, that's just how it goes. Yeah, at first I was like very confused because like the director agreed with me, but the co-workers were like, how dare you? And I was well, like, I think hmm. intimidation is all, you know, people are intimidated by, you know, big thinkers and loud talkers, but like that at the end of the day is what gets you at the table. So do you, and like really follow your gut and intuition. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Oh my God, I want this to go on forever. I'm so, this is so, oh my gosh, you guys, we need to take a selfie before we get off. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> I think I have to do the other, I have to do two because I think it was right. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Cute, love it. Does anyone else have anything, any questions? I think Tiana has one, Gabby, you go. Oh yeah, 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 okay. sorry, I can't see. Let me see. Yes. Hey, Tiana. What's up? Hi. Uh, thank you for this. Um, my question was like, I'm like a recent grad and like I wanted advice on like now like going into the working world where a lot of the jobs I feel like are corporate design jobs and like that's where the money is, but that's not where my heart is. Mm. Like I've done like corporate internships and I'm like, I don't like the structure and the way this works. And like, mm. I know it's like a work up system, but it's like, it's not creative enough for me. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like I'm a person who has like a lot of creative direction. Like I'm like, I see myself as a creative director, not working under people. Yeah. So like, yeah. what is your advice? Like what to do? And also like, I don't want to be in New York and everything is in New York. I'm like, I want to create that fashion like vision also in like Philadelphia where I went to school I'm like mm -hmm. what was your advice to like navigating that and like things or tools that I should be using and doing I think that one of the most useful resources that I um I don't think I tapped into as much as I wish I had um in the beginning of my career is like my colleagues like my contemporaries like they're you feel that you know the world in which you have to work are like too corporate and not creative enough for you there is a photographer who's taking like stock photography to pay the bills but like that doesn't work for them there's probably like a makeup artist who's like at the sephora desk doing like beauty make a bridal makeup that wants to be more exploratory like find your people and then create work together and to to the point of our earliest question about social media it's like you have a built-in platform and like people will see it, <laughs> you know, like I see things that have 10 likes on them because of what else I'm looking at and what I'm scrolling through. And I think if you want to be a designer, yes, like resources become an issue because you have to work with so much raw material. But I would say like, go to a thrift store and like cut up like t-shirts and dresses and like create your own patterns and make something out of them and make a vision that that you feel communicates what you want to be doing professionally and then use that as your book and like use that as your calling card so that when you go out for roles that are outside of the corporate landscape you have work that demonstrates the level of creativity that you're interested in exploring but i really think we call them test shoots because are you you're a designer you're saying yes yeah, we call them test shoots. And I don't know if you've, if you've done them yet, maybe you have, but we, you know, it would be like the fashion assistant would hook up with the makeup assistant who would hook up with the hair assistant with the photo assistant. And then you would do your mini version of a shoot that you do in support of your bosses. And people really look at that work um, critically. Like I've had people come to internships with me with test shoots where, yeah, they're styling out of their own closet, but I can, I get a sense of their aesthetic. I get a sense of their drive, their creative ambition. And you know, so much of this industry is like follow through and just like getting it done, like doing the work. That's one thing that Virgil would say a lot. And when he was like, this isn't a marathon, it's a sprint. It's like, just do it. Like literally just do it. Yeah, that's great. Cause I was literally having an idea with like one of my friends, like, oh, we could do like a picnic shoot. I have this idea, this color concept. I was like, we just need a tripod. Like we can get this together and like do something. It's really cool. So yeah, oh, thank you so much. You could literally buy like, I don't know, like 
table, like picnic tablecloths and like use that as, and like drape it into some, you know, I think like mm-hmm. exactly what you're saying, you have the ideas, like just make them happen. And you have to sacrifice a lot of times. Like maybe you can't like go out to drinks with your friend on Friday because you have to spend that $75, like getting scrap fabric, but you really can make it happen for yourself. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Debbie, thank you. I know you, I don't want you to be late for this meeting that you have. So oh, yeah, you guys, I have to go see the devil in Prada. So that's all. <laughs> She's actually a sweetheart. She's actually a sweetheart. But yes, that's um, I do have a big meeting. So well, uh, really wonderful as I knew it would be, and yeah, really, really meaningful. Thank you. That's and I, I love that we started with you in 2012 and here you are. So thank you, Gabrielle, for everything. And you know, I think you've been so generous with your advice and your suggestion of being available to, yeah. to us. So um thank you for that. Please do. I'm very, I'm, I'm really sincere about that. Please. If anyone has any questions that you couldn't ask on this, you know, send them to Peter. Peter can send them to me. Yeah. We can like figure out a way. Like I would really love to continue talking to you guys. Thank you so much. And you were so inspiring to me and congratulations. This is thousands of applicants and you guys are here. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay. Thanks, bye guys. everyone. See you soon. See ya. Bye.